Chapter Nine of Super Women. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Betty B. Super Women by Albert Payson Terhune. Chapter Nine. Madame Du Barry, the Seven Million Dollar Siren. She came from the same neighborhood that had produced Joan of Arc she even claimed relationship to the long-dead maid but at that point all likeness between the two comes to a very abrupt end she is known to history as marie jeanne gomard de vaubernier comtesse du berry the parish register of her birthplace describes her less flamboyantly as marie jeanne natural daughter of anne becou known as quantigny born august a d seventeen forty six there are many details in marie jean du barry's story that i am going to omit at my own request not only because they are unwritable but because their sordid vulgarity is also drearily stupid i apologize in advance for the omissions but even after the process of weeding out i think there will be quite enough left to hold the interest when marie was six anne becou drifted to paris the mecca of her trade and soon afterward an admirer of anne's one du monceau was coaxed into lavishing two dollars and forty cents a month on marie's education du monceau had been one of anne's wooers in the village days and it has been suggested that his interest in little marie was prompted by more than mere kindness in fact that he and the infant were more than kin and less than kind in any case the monthly two dollars and forty cents paid marie's expenses in a convent school where she spent the next ten years this saint aurore convent in the rue neuve saint genevieve was a philanthropic refuge for all young persons of honest parentage who are in circumstances where they run the risk of ruin the rules of the saint aurore were far stricter and icier than those of the most investigable of modern orphanages among the punishments inflicted on these little wards of god were starvation beatings and imprisonment in cold and stone-floored dark cells for the very mildest transgressions three dire sins calling always for instant retribution were to laugh to sing and to speak above a whisper for such hideous and unnatural crimes as laughter song and ordinary speech these poor loveless babies were treated like the vilest criminals one hopes morbidly that the theologians who abolished hell left at least one warm corner of it in commission for the framers and enforcers of those gentle rules all the foregoing is not sentimental mush but is mentioned to show how dire must have been a pupil's sin that the convent authorities could not cope with and such a sin no one knows what it was marie committed when she was sixteen for which she was expelled in black disgrace from her happy childhood home at st aurore and turned loose upon the world her mother's loving arms were open ready to receive and succor the disgraced girl and to start her afresh in life as only a mother can so to keep marie from feeling unduly dependent upon a poor working woman like herself she taught her her own trade the oldest on earth with a little basket of cheap jewelry which served the same purpose as a present-day beggar's stock of lead pencils marie went the rounds of the streets her career was cut out for her by her mother's fond forethought and in nine hundred and ninety-nine cases out of a thousand a girl thus launched would have ended in the gutter but marie was the thousandth woman a true superwoman in every sense of the word the filth of the streets could not smirch her outwardly and luck was waiting around the corner for her a rich and eccentric old woman of fashion madame lagrade had a craze for amateur theatricals catching sight of marie one day she was struck by the girl's beauty and hired her partly as a companion and partly as a comedian for her private theatre at madame lagrade's marie got her first view of semi-decent society and being adaptable she picked up a smattering of manners and of grammatical speech only a smattering but all she cared to acquire there too she met such men as the withered old wit 
de richelieu and the prince de soubise and the duc de brizac whose son was one day to be the one real love of her life here too she met a genius whom she describes in her memoirs as a cunning fox witty very ugly and very thin he was grim the fairy-tale man marie was in clover but the fortune was too good to last and because a far more glittering fortune was awaiting her just around the corner destiny soon joggled the girl out of her snug berth madame legrade had two sons both of them fell crazily in love with marie it is not on record that she told them she would rather be the poor working girl that she was and madame legrade in horror ordered her out of the house back to her dear old loving mother as before went marie and once more mother love came to the rescue anne becu had recently married a lackey of some great house she was now madame racon marie adopted her stepfather's name the first to which she had ever possessed even a semi-legal claim and permitted her mother to get her a job in the millinery shop of madame labille this shop was of a sort extremely common in that day it sold not only hats for women but sword knots and shoe buckles for men it employed only girls of extreme beauty and it was a favorite lounging place for men about town altogether there was no startling change in marie's vocation from the era when she had hawked artificial jewelry her presence drew scores of young dandies to the shop and she might readily have had her pick of the lot but during a momentary weakness of intellect she plunged into a love affair with a handsome young pastry cook nicholas mothon the other and more ambitious girls guyed her right unmercifully for her plebeian tastes but it was terribly serious with marie mathon was the first man to whom she had lost her heart many years later she wrote when i call to memory all the men who have adored me i must say it was not poor nicholas who pleased me least for i too have known what first love can mean but she forgot what first love can mean as readily as she had learned it for soon she threw over nicholas for a man of wealth named de la vauvenardiere and she abandoned the latter for a suitor named duval and ousted duval from her affection for la May, the court hairdresser no in choosing la May, she was not lowering her standard a court hairdresser was far more than a mere barber he was a functionary of vast importance the confidant of the great the counsellor of the unwary a man of substance and position the only tradesman in all france who was permitted by court edict to wear a sword marie was envied as la May's sweetheart until he went broke overnight and had to flee to england to dodge a debtor's cell then came the cost incident at least then it began cost or louis hercule Timoleon de cost brisac was the duc de brisac's son he met marie in the street one day so runs the story followed her to the shop and there under the pretext of buying a sword knot fell in to talk with her he loved her at first sight and she loved him theirs was not such a love as either had hitherto known it was the genuine article cos was young and good-looking and afflicted with republican ideas he did not see in marie the vendor of cheap jewelry and cheaper affections nor the girl who used her millinery job as a mask to him she was an angel and so far as concerned him she was they were young and they dreamed cos was unlike any man marie had known his love was utterly unlike any love she had known or heard of altogether it was a pretty little romance on both sides and if we smile at it let the smile be kindly with nothing of the leer about it for there was nothing to provoke a leer at least not then this coast affair's early stages are so intertangled with romance legend court rumor and later inventions that i hasten to forestall corrections from readers wiser than i by confessing that all i know of it or can learn from supposedly reliable sources is that marie and cos parted somewhat suddenly and the causes variously given are that his father put a stop to the romance and that cos learned something of marie's real character it is gravely declared that he wanted to marry her and that his indignant ducal parent not only opened his eyes to the bride-elect's past 
but threatened to throw costs into the bastille by means of a lettre de cachet as i said i vouch for none of these reasons for the break between the two lovers it is all surmise but what follows is not the next man to lose his head and heart to marie was a young nobleman whose repute may be guessed from the fact that even in dissolute eighteenth-century paris he was known not as a roue but as the roue he had come to paris a few years earlier leaving a wife somewhere on the way he had squandered his patrimony en route and reached the capital penniless but he quickly caught the fancy of madame maluse who had influence at court she arranged that he should have practically the sole monopoly of supplying the french navy with all its various forms of merchandise this meant fat profits and he fattened them still further by running a select gambling house he was jean viscount du berry jean met and fell victim to marie realizing what a cash attraction her beauty and charm could be made he installed her as presiding genius of his gambling house as a lure to draw youthful nobles to the place marie or madame lange as for no known reason she had begun to call herself was the bright star at the chance goddess shine and the money poured fast into the crooked games whereby the house made jean rich for a time there was wholesale prosperity all around with plenty more of it to come before i go on may i quote a contemporary writer's word picture of marie as she appeared at this time her hair is long silky curling like a child's and blonde with a natural ash tint her eyebrows and lashes are dark and curly behind them the blue eyes which one seldom sees quite open look out with coquettish sidelong glances her nose is small and finely cut and her mouth is a perfect cupid's bow her neck her arms and her feet and hands remind one of ancient greek statuary while her complexion is that of a rose leaf steeped in milk she carries with her a delicious atmosphere of intoxication victorious amorous youth voltaire once exclaimed before a portrait of her the original was made for the gods even as the cherry tree was posthumously invented for washington and perhaps the apple for william tell and the egg for columbus so around marie in after years sprang up countless tales of her youth some may have been true some were palpable lies to which does the ensuing anecdote belong in the spring of seventeen sixty eight during her sojourn as come on for the dubarry gambling hell marie noticed three days in succession that she was closely followed on the street by a young man of a sober cast of countenance and elegant attire now to be followed was no novelty to marie and more than one man of elegant attire had sued in vain for her favor yet this youth made no advances he simply followed her wherever she went and in his absence his face haunted her strangely so on the fourth day as she turned suddenly in the street and saw him close behind her she asked with affected indignation what do you want of me the man bowed low with no shadow of hesitancy made this cryptic answer to her query mademoiselle will you grant me the first reasonable request i may make of you when you are queen of france thinking he was a crank as perhaps he was she sought to humor him and replied certainly monsieur i promise you take me for a madman he returned with a second grave bow but i am not insane adieu mademoiselle there will be nothing more extraordinary than your elevation except your end he spoke and vanished either into the street crowd or into thin air you may recall the story of the man in black's midnight visit to ninon de l'enclos with a gift for the essence of youth and the warning of her death this was a well-believed and oft-repeated narrative in marie's day it is highly possible that she built from it her recital of the adventure of the elegantly attired stranger at all events she told jean du berry about it whether or not he believed it is no concern of yours or mine but it assuredly gave him an idea the supreme idea of his rotten life he saw a one in fifty chance of making more money through marie than she could have earned for him in a century as divinity of his gambling rooms and remote as were the scheme's prospects for success 
he resolved to make a gambler's cast at the venture louis the fifteenth king of france had been ruled for nearly twenty years by the marquis de pompadour who had squandered royal revenues had made and unmade men's career by a nod or a shake of her pretty head and had played at ducks and drakes with international politics and now madame de pompadour was dead many a younger and prettier face had caught louis's doddering fancy since her death but no other maîtresse en titre had ruled him and france since then briefly jean coveted the vacant office for marie not for her own sake jean did not care for her happiness or welfare or for the happiness or welfare of any mortal on earth except of one jean vicomte du berry but he foresaw that with marie as the royal favourite he himself as her sponsor could reap a harvest such as is not the guerdon of one man in a million he set to work at his self-appointed task with the same rare vigour and cunning that he so long enabled him to elude the hangman and to live on better men's money the first step was to engage the help of la belle the king's valet de chambre la belle was nominally a servant but in a sense he was mightier than any prime minister for louis relied inexplicably on the valet's taste in feminine beauty it was la belle for instance who had first brought madame de pompadour to the king's notice he had done the same good turn to many another aspiring damsel and now heavily bribed by jean du berry he consented to see if marie was worth mentioning to louis the connoisseur valet realized to the full her superwoman charm he recognized her as the thousandth woman even the millionth yet la belle was ever cautious about raising false hopes so not knowing that jean had gone over the whole plan with marie he asked her if she would honour him by attending a little informal dinner he was soon to give in his apartment at the versailles palace a dinner in honour of the baron de gonesse marie with sweet innocence accepted the invitation then timidly asked la belle if she might sit beside him at the dinner as all the others would be strangers to her the bare thought of his presuming to sit down in the presence of the king otherwise the baron de gonesse so filled la belle with horror that he forgot his role of diplomacy and blurted out i sit at the table with him i shall be unexpectedly called from the room as usual just as dinner is served and i shall not return until it is over when marie carefully coached as to behaviour repartee and so forth by the ever thoughtful jean arrived at la belle's apartments in the palace on the night of the dinner she found to her disgust that the king was nowhere in sight not even disguised as the baron de gonesse and that her fellow guests were merely a group of versailles officials not being versed in palace secrets she did not know that louis was seated in a dark closet behind a film curtain window looking into the brightly lighted dining-room and noting everything that went on nor that cunningly arranged speaking-tubes brought every whispered or loud-spoken word to him finding the king was not to be one of the guests the girl philosophically choked back her chagrin and set herself to get every atom of fun out of the evening that she could she ate much drank more and behaved pretty quite like a gloriously lovely street gammon there was no use in wasting on these understrappers the fine speeches and the courtesy she had been learning for the king's benefit so she let herself go and the dinner was lively to say the very least in fact it was the gayest most deliciously amusing dinner ever held in those sedate rooms thanks to marie louis in paroxysm of laughter looked on until the sound of his guffaws betrayed his royal presence then he came out of hiding marie for an instant was thunderstruck at what she had done she feared she had ruined her chances by the boisterous gaiety of the past hour or so then for her brain was as quick as her talk was dull she saw the fight was not lost but won and she knew how she had won it louis the fifteenth was fifty-eight years old he lived in france's most artificial period no one dared be natural least of all in the presence of the king all his life he had been treated to honeyed words profound reverence the most polished and adroit courtesy people women especially had never dared be human 
when he was around marie saw that it was the novelty of her behavior which had aroused the king's bored interest and from that moment her course was taken she did not cringe at his feet or pretend innocence or assume grand dame airs she was herself marie becu the slangy light-hearted feather-brained daughter of the streets respecting nothing fearing nothing confused by nothing as ready to shriek gutter oaths at her king as at her footman and of course she was also marie becu the superwoman whose magnetism and beauty were utterly irresistible the combination was too much for louis he succumbed what else was there for him to do after the myriad poses of the women he had known marie's naturalness was like a bracing breeze sweeping through a hothouse a slum breeze if you like but none the less a breeze and delightfully welcome to the jaded old monarch louis fell in love with marie it was not a mere infatuation of an hour like most of his affairs he fell completely and foolishly in love with her and he never fell out of love with her as long as he lived la belle was in despair he had hoped marie might amuse the king he had had no shadow of an idea that the affair would go further by reason of his privileges as an old servant he actually ventured to remonstrate with louis sire he protested she is not even legitimate the birth records attest that then laughed the king let the right authorities make her so accordingly messengers were sent post haste to her babyhood home and a new birth certificate was drawn up also a certificate attesting to her mother's legal marriage to a holy mythical monsieur de gomard de vaubernier and to several other statements that made marie's legitimacy as solid as gibraltar also pleaded the valet she is neither a wife nor a woman of title we can arrange both those trifles the king assured him and with charming simplicity the thing was done jean sent for his worthless elder brother guillaume comte de berry who was at that time an army captain and on september first seventeen sixty eight marie and guillaume were duly married the lucky bridegroom received enough money to pay all his debts and to make him rich then he obligingly deserted his new-made wife at the church door according to programme and wandered away to spend his fortune as might best please him thereby marie becu became madame la comtesse du berry without having her cur of a husband to bother about a list of her possessions and their values duly set down in the marriage contract which is still on file shows the state of marie's finances at this time i copy it for the benefit of those who may be interested to learn of a useful life's by-products at twenty-two in seventeen sixty eight so says the contract marie was the sole owner of one diamond necklace worth sixteen hundred dollars an aigrette and a pair of earrings in clusters worth sixteen hundred dollars thirty dresses and petticoats worth six hundred dollars lace dress trimmings caps etc worth twelve hundred dollars six dozen shirts of fine linen twelve complete morning dresses and other articles of linen etc worth four hundred dollars one obstacle alone now barred marie's road to supremacy according to unbreakable royal etiquette three things were indispensable to the woman who aspired to become a french king's maîtresse en titre she must be legitimate she must be of noble rank and she must have been presented at court the first two conditions marie had fulfilled the third was a poser in order to be presented at court some reputable woman of the old nobility must act as sponsor and not one decent woman of high rank would sink to acting as sponsor for marie moreover the king declared he did not care whether she were presented or not and he would take no step to help her in the matter without this presentation she could not appear publicly at court she could not sway overt political influence she could not have a suite of rooms at the palace between a presentation and no presentation lay all the difference between uncrowned queen and a light o love and no one would sponsor marie jean de berry at last solved the problem as he had solved all the rest he had able assistance for a court clique had been formed to back marie's pretensions the clique was headed by such men as the old duc de richelieu and the much younger duc d'aguillon the latter was violently in love with marie 
and there's no reason to think that his love was hopeless but the rest of the clique cared not a straw about her to them the whole thing was a master move in politics with marie in control of the king and themselves in control of marie they foresaw an era of unlimited power the duc de choiseul prime minister of france was the sworn enemy of this clique which formed the opposition and choiseul swore to move heaven and earth to prevent marie's presentation for he knew it would lead to his own political ruin as it did jean du berry hunted around until he discovered somewhere in navarre a crotchety and impoverished old widow the dowager comtesse de berne she was a scion of the ancient nobility the decayed and dying branch of a once mighty tree she was not only poor to the verge of starvation but she had a passion for lawsuits she had just lost a suit and was on the verge of bankruptcy the good-hearted jean through the clique's help arranged to have the case reopened and the decision reversed this was before our own day of an incorruptible judiciary he also promised her a gift of twenty thousand dollars in gold all this in return for the trifling service of journeying up to paris and thence to versailles to act as sponsor for the lovely madame du berry who had wilfully declared that she would be presented under no less auspices than those of the illustrious comtesse de berne the old comtesse accepted the offer with all the shrinking reluctance a hungry dog shows at the proffer of a bone she came up to paris at the expense of the clique and was immured in jean's house with the gambler's sister jean fanchon de berry as her jailer and entertainer choiseul through his spies learned of the plot and he tried in every way to kidnap the old lady or to outbribe the duberries meanwhile coached by jean the fair marie was making king louis's life miserable by throwing herself at his feet in season and out of season and beseeching him to silence her enemies for ever by allowing her to be presented when these tactics failed she would let loose upon the poor king a flood of gutter language roundly abusing him turning the air blue with her profanity and in other ways showing her inalienable right to a place in court circles louis would promise nothing the turmoil alternately bored and amused him at last april twenty first seventeen sixty nine on his return from the hunt after an unusually good day's sport the king casually remarked to all concerned the presentation of madame la comtesse du berry will occur at to-morrow evening's levee the traditional and well-thumbed bombshell exploding among them would have created no more stir in court circles then did this yawned announcement choiseul and his followers were in despair jean ran around in circles making preparations for the triumph marie rehearsed for the hundredth time the complicated forms of etiquette the occasion called for the choiseul faction tried one thing after another to block the ceremony they kidnapped marie's hairdresser stole the coach in which she was to make the trip from her paris house to versailles arranged a hold-up on the road and so forth thanks to jean's wit and clique's power a new hairdresser and coach were provided in the nick of time and the versailles road was so heavily guarded that a regiment of cavalry could scarce have dared intercept the carriage according to one story choiseul even got a message past all the carefully reared barriers to madame du berne prevailing on her to plead agonized illness and to keep to her bed on the evening set for the presentation whereupon so runs the yarn a character actor from the comedie francaise was paid to make up as madame de berne and to perform her functions of sponsor this may or may not be true it forms the central theme of de vere stackpole's novel the presentation on the great night the court was assembled tensely waiting for marie to arrive at the appointed time no madame du berry appeared the minutes grew into an hour people began to whisper and fidget the choiseul party looked blissful the clique could not hide its worry louis stood frowning between the suspense-stricken d'aiguillon and richelieu at last he turned from them and stared moodily out of a window then moving back into the room he opened his lips to declare the levee at an inn as he started to speak an usher announced madame la comtesse de berne madame la comtesse du berry and marie entered with her sponsor 
or with someone who looks sufficiently like madame de berne to deceive any one according to one version marie was late because at the last instant another choiseul obstacle had to be cleared away according to another she was purposely late to enhance the dramatic interest of her arrival here is an account of the presentation madame du berry with her chaperone advanced to where the king stood between their graces the dukes of richelieu and aiguillon the formal words were spoken and madame du berry sank to the ground before the king in a profound curtsey he raised her right hand courteously his lips twitching with laughter she was decked in jewels priced at nineteen thousand dollars the gift of the king she was garbed in one of the triumphant gowns that the women of the hour termed a fighting dress so radiant an apparition was she so dazzling at the first minute of surprise that even her enemies could not libel her beauty after she was presented to the king she was duly presented to mesdames to the dauphin to the children of france marie had won for the next five years she was the real queen of france and during that time she cost the french nation in cold cash something over seven million dollars she was not at all on the style of the pompadour who had yearned to meddle in politics marie cared nothing for politics except to help out her army of friends and dependents she had no ambitions she had not even craved on her own account to be the king's maîtresse en titre all she wanted was to have a good time and she had it the pleasure was all hers the french people did the paying until years later they exacted bloody settlement of the score pompadour had worn out her life trying to amuse the unamusable to find novelties that would entertain the king marie did nothing of the sort instead she demanded that the king amuse her pompadour had sought to sway the destinies of nations marie was quite happy if she could spend the revenues of her own nation she treated louis in a way that caused the court to gasp with horror she scolded him shrilly petted him in public as if he had been her peasant spouse and always addressed him as france he enjoyed it it was a novelty once when she was giving an informal breakfast with a dozen or more nobles its guests she ordered the king to make the coffee amused he obeyed she took one sip of the royal brewed beverage then tossed the cup into the fireplace exclaiming france your coffee is as insipid as your talk all political matters she turned over to d'aguillon who was the clique spokesman to please him and to get even for old scores she caused the ruin of choiseul the mode of choiseul's downfall is interesting as a sidelight on court intrigue the clique taught marie how to poison the king's ever suspicious mind against the prime minister and she did so with great success thanks to her louis was held to believe that choiseul feeling his power over the monarch slipping was planning a war scare with spain so that he could prove his seeming worth to the kingdom of france by dispelling the cloud the clique having access through a spy to all of choiseul's correspondence resorted to a fairly ingenious trick at marie's suggestion choiseul's secretary was summoned to the palace he was in the clique's pay before the king he was questioned as to what he knew about choiseul's affairs the man with an air of mystery answered that he knew nothing of them but that he would give his majesty one hint let the king request choiseul to write a letter to spain assuring that nation of france's peaceful intent should choiseul do so without comment it would show that he was not plotting a war scare as charged but should he hesitate well what could that prove instead the plotters already knew that choiseul had that very day sent a letter to spain proposing the mutual signing of a declaration of peace between the nations the king requested his minister to send a letter that was almost identical with the one he had already written and dispatched naturally choiseul hesitated and the work was done yet out of careless good nature she would not have bothered to harm anybody politically or otherwise if she had had her own way marie insisted that the king settle a liberal pension on the fallen minister this despite the fact that choiseul and his sister madame de gramont had both worked with all their might and main to block her rise she was good too as they all were to her mother she presented the horrible old woman with two or three estates and a generous income she did the same for her titular husband guillaume 
comte de berry her lightest fancy was enough to make or wreck any frenchman everybody high or low was at her mercy people of the bluest blood vied for chances to win her favor the chevalier de la morliere dedicated his book on fatalism to her the duc de tresmes calling on her sent in a note the monkey of madame la comtesse begs an audience the dauphin afterward louis the sixteenth and marie antoinette the dauphiness were forced to abase themselves before this vulgarian woman whom they loathed she reigned supreme extravagant as pompadour had been marie was tenfold more so she not only made the king gratify her every crazy whim but she spent much time inventing crazy whims for him to gratify if anything on sale was costly enough she wanted it whether it was pretty or hideous all marie demanded was that the article should be beyond the reach of any one else in consequence people who wanted to please her used to shower her with gifts more noteworthy for cost and for unusualness than for beauty and one of these gifts chanced to be a jet-black and quaintly deformed ten-year-old slave boy from bengal the slave's native name was unpronounceable and the prince of conti who had bought him from a sea captain and presented him to marie renamed him louis zamor marie was delighted with the boy as soon as she heard the price paid for him and that he was the only one of his species in france she dressed him in outlandish eastern garb and she used to tease him into screeching rages as a mischievous child might tease a monkey the slave child grew to detest his lovely owner remember louis zamor please he will come back into the story here is a correct but incomplete list of marie's personal expenditures during the five years of her reign as brevet queen of france to goldsmiths and jewelers four hundred and twenty four thousand dollars to merchants of silks laces linens millinery one hundred and forty seven thousand five hundred dollars for furniture pictures vases etc twenty three thousand five hundred dollars to gilders sculptors workers in marble seventy five thousand dollars on her estate at lucienne whose chateau was built in three months by the architect ledoux whom she thrust into the academy for doing it she spent sixty five thousand dollars the heirs of one firm of creditors were as late as eighteen thirty six still claiming the sum of one hundred and thirty thousand dollars from her estate she had state dresses hooped dresses dresses sur la consideration robe de toilette dresses costing two hundred dollars four hundred dollars six hundred dollars and one thousand dollars dresses with a base of silver strewn with clusters of feathers dresses striped with big bars of gold mosaic dresses shot with gold and adorned with myrtle and riding habits of white indian silk that cost twelve hundred dollars she had dresses whose elaborate embroidery alone cost twenty one hundred dollars her dressing gowns had lace on them worth five hundred dollars and eight hundred dollars she had cuffs of lace costing one hundred and twenty five dollars point lace caps valued at three hundred dollars and point argentan costumes at eighteen hundred dollars she ordered gold ornaments and trinkets of all sorts galore roetier the goldsmith received an order from her for a toilet set of solid gold for which she had a sudden whim the government advanced twelve thousand ounces of gold for it bomer the paris jeweler knowing of her love for ultra costly things made up for her a huge diamond necklace of a heterogeneous mass of many carat diamonds arranged with regard to show and wholly without a thought of good taste the necklace was so big and so expensive that marie declared at once she must have it louis willingly consented to buy it for her but he died before the purchase was made and bomer was left with the ugly treasure loop on his hands long afterward he tried to sell it to marie antoinette and from that transaction rose the mystery of the queen's necklace which did much to hasten the french revolution in the spring of seventeen seventy four as king louis and marie were driving toward versailles they saw a pretty girl in a wayside field gathering grass for her cow louis greeted the girl with a fatherly smile the girl looked back at him with perfect indifference piqued at such unwonted contempt for his royal self the king got out of his carriage waddled across to where the girl stood and kissed her 
the reason she had seemed indifferent was because she was dazed the reason she was dazed was that she was in the early stages of smallpox louise caught the infection and died a few days later the first act of louis the sixteenth the king's grandson and successor was to order marie to a convent later he softened the decree by allowing her to live at lucienne or anywhere else outside a ten-mile radius from paris then it was that the fallen favorite met cosse once more and their old-time love story recommenced this time on a less platonic footing she kept her title of comtesse and had enough money as she paid few of her debts to live in luxury still beautiful still loved still moderately young the revolution burst forth marie enrolled herself as a staunch loyalist hearing that the king and queen were pressed for funds she wrote to marie antoinette lucienne is yours madame all that i possess comes to me from the royal family i am too grateful ever to forget it the late king with a sort of presentiment forced me to accept a thousand precious objects i have had the honor of making you an inventory of these treasures i offer them to you with eagerness you have so many expenses to meet and benefits without number to bestow permit me i entreat you to render unto caesar that which is caesar's when the king and queen were beheaded she secretly wore black for them also she made a trip to england where she tried to sell some of her jewels to help the royalist cause all these things were duly repeated to the revolutionary government by louis zamour her bengalese servant one evening she was expecting a visit from cosse but midnight came and he had not appeared go down the road she ordered zamour who had just returned from an errand to paris and see if you can catch sight of him i can show him to you or part of him without troubling to do that retorted zamour with sudden insolence whipping one hand from behind his back he tossed on the floor at marie's feet the head of her lover cosse had been guillotined that day zamour in return for certain information to the government had received the head as a gift the information he had given led to marie's arrest on the following charges having wasted the treasures of the state conspiring with the enemies of the republic and having in london worn mourning for the late king marie was sentenced to death on december seventh seventeen ninety three and was beheaded the same day almost alone of all the french women thus put to death she turned coward at the last the strain of peasant blood came to the fore and where aristocrats rode smiling to the scaffold marie du Berry behaved like a panic-stricken child she fell on her knees and begged for her life she told where every article of value she possessed was buried in her garden if she thought thus to buy back her life she did not understand the souls of such men as her captors they heard her to the end jotting down the directions for finding her treasure then when she was put into the tumbrel and was started on her way to the scaffold the journey led past the old millinery shop where she had once worked as she caught sight of its sign she screamed out twice the crowd had long ago grown accustomed to the sight of death now they seemed to awaken to the fact that they were about to kill a woman a wondrous beautiful woman at that a sigh of pity ran through the throng the driver in charge of the tumbrel fearing a riot and a rescue whipped up the horses and drove on with his load there were others besides madame du Berry in the death wagon the cart reached the scaffold at four thirty in the afternoon marie was the first to mount the steps to the guillotine says de goncourt her biographer they heard her on the steps of the scaffold lost and desperate mad with anguish and terror struggling imploring begging for mercy crying help help like a woman being assassinated by robbers then fell the axe edge and marie's seven million dollar debt to the people of france was paid End of chapter 9chapter 10 of superwomen this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org superwomen by albert payson terhune chapter 10 the most gorgeous lady blessington she was the ugly duckling of a family of seven beautiful children the children of queer old shiver the frills power of tipperary 
her name was marguerite her father picked out a pretty name for the homely girl and then considered his duty done marguerite was a great trial to everybody to her good-looking brothers and lovely sisters to shiver the frills who was bitterly chagrined that his record for beauteous offspring should have been marred by so hideous an exception to the family governess who wouldn't even take the trouble to teach her to read to the neighbors whose joy in beauty she offended altogether marguerite was taught to consider herself a mistake it is a lesson that children learn with pitiful readiness perhaps the mystic unpardonable sin consists in teaching them such a damnable doctrine her father's baptismal name was not really shiver the frills though nobody ever spoke of him by any other term he had been christened edmund and he was a squireen of the tipperary village of knockbrit he was a local magistrate and he fulfilled his magisterial office almost as well as a mad dog might have done he had an insane temper. He did not confine this to his home, where he beat his children and servants most unmercifully, but aired it on the bench as well. Notably, when, in a rage, he lawlessly commandeered a troop of dragoons and galloped over Tipperary and Waterford counties with them, hunting down and killing peasants who had stirred his anger to maniac heat by some petty uprising. He was a dandy, fop, macaroni, toff, whatever you choose, too, in a tarnished and down-at-heel way. And from his habit of eternally shaking out his dirty shirt ruffles and lace wristbands in order to keep them from hanging limply, he was called Shiver the Frills. Marguerite's home life was one unbroken hell. Starvation, shabby genteel rags, beatings and full-flavored curses were her daily portion a kind-hearted neighbor miss ann dwyer took pity on the poor abused little ugly duckling and taught her to read and write but for this she would have grown up too ignorant to pass the very simplest literacy test and an odd use the child proceeded to make of her smattering of education before she could spell correctly she began to write stories these she would read aloud by the peat smolder on winter evenings to her awed brothers and sisters who looked on such an accomplishment as little short of supernatural wonderful stories she wrote all about princesses who had all the clothes they could wear and who could afford three square meals with real butter every single day of their lives and about princes who never swore at or beat children or flew into crazy rages or even fluttered dirty ruffles the girl's gift at story writing gave her a higher place in the family esteem than she had ever enjoyed before so did another miracle which came to pass when marguerite was about twelve she grew pretty the ugly duckling in less than a single year developed from repulsive homeliness into a striking beauty in fact by the time she was fourteen she was far and away the loveliest of all the exquisite power sisters then began her career of superwoman for with dawning beauty came an access of the elusive charm that sets marguerite's type apart from the rest of womankind and men were swift to recognize her claim to their worship the swains whom shiver the frills allowed to visit his tumble-down mansion paid court to her instead of to her sisters the fame of her reached the nearby garrison town of clonmel and brought a host of young redcoat officers swarming to the knockbrit house of these officers two soon put themselves far in the van of all other contestants they were captain murray and captain maurice st leger farmer murray was a jolly happy-go-lucky penniless chap lovable and ardent the kindest thing one can say about captain farmer is that he was more than half insane marguerite met captain murray's courtship more than halfway 
but shiver the frills told the sighing but impecunious swain to keep off and ordered marguerite to marry farmer who had a snug fortune marguerite very naturally objected shiver the frills flew into a ready-made rage and frightened the poor youngster almost to death by his threats of what should befall her if she did not change her mind so cowed into submission she meekly agreed to marry farmer and marry him she did in eighteen o five when she was but fifteen it was an early marrying age even in that era of early marriages many years had passed since sheridan's metrical toast to the maiden of bashful fifteen and as now a girl of fifteen was deemed too young for wedlock but all this did not deter old shiver the frills from a laudable firmness in getting rid of the daughter he hated so he married her off to a man who ought to have been in an insane asylum in an asylum for the criminally insane at that if marguerite's life at knockbrit had been unhappy her new life was positive torture farmer's temper was worse than shiver the frills and he added habitual drunkenness to his other allurements there is no profit in going into full details of marguerite's horrible sojourn with him one of his milder amusements was to pinch her until the blood spurted from her white flesh he flogged her as he never dared flog his dogs and he used to lock her for days in an unheated room in winter with nothing to eat or drink marguerite stood it as long as she could then she ran away you can imagine how insufferable she had found farmer when i say she went back by choice to her father's house shiver the frills greeted the unhappy girl with one of his dear old rages his rage was not leveled at the cur who had so vilely misused her but against the young wife who had committed the crime of deserting her husband not being of the breed that uses bare fingers to test the efficiency of buzz saws i neither express nor so much as dare to cherish in secret any opinion whatsoever on the theme of women's rights but it is a wholly safe and non-controversial thing to say that the fate of woman at large and especially of husband deserters to-day is paradise by comparison with what it was a century ago for leaving a husband who had not refused to harbor her marguerite became in a measure an outcast she could not divorce farmer she could not make him support her unless she would return to him she was eyed askance by the elect her own family felt that she was smirched shiver the frills cursed her roundly and is said to have assumed the heavy father role by ordering her to leave his ramshackle old house without money without protector without reputation she was cast adrift there was no question of alimony of legal redress of freedom the laws were all on farmer's side so was public opinion strange to say no public benefactor even took the trouble to horsewhip the husband he was not even ostracized from his own circle for his treatment to his girl wife remember this was in the earliest years of the nineteenth century and in a country where many people still regarded wife beating as a healthful indoor sport less than three decades had elapsed since a man immortalized by thackeray had made the proud boast that during the first year of his married life he had never when sober struck his wife in anger nor was it so very long after the lord chief justice of england handed down an official decision that a man might legally punish his wife with a rod no thicker than his lordship's thumb whereat one woman inquired anxiously whether his lordship chanced to suffer from gouty swelling of the hands oh it was a merry time and a merry land for women this merry england of the good old days marguerite vanished from home from friends from family and a blank space follows in the lives of scores of superwomen of lola montez 
Marie de Chevreuse, Lady Hamilton, Adam Menken, Peg Woffington, Adrien Le Couvreur, even of Cleopatra. There was somewhere a hiatus, a dark spot that they would never afterward consent to illumine. And such a line of asterisks sheared its way across Marguerite's page at this point. She is next heard of as leading a charmingly unnunlike existence at Cahir, and two years later at Dublin. At the Irish metropolis, she enamored the great Sir Thomas Lawrence, whose portrait of her is one of his most famous paintings, and one that is familiar to nearly everybody. The picture was painted in 1809, when Marguerite was just twenty and in the early prime of her beauty. She had ever a knack of enslaving army men, and her next wooer, in fact, Lawrence's lucky rival, was an Irish captain, one Jenkins. She and Jenkins fell very seriously in love with each other. There was nothing at all platonic in their relations. Jenkins was eager to marry Marguerite, and when he found he could not do so because of the trifling obstacle that her husband was alive, he sought a chance to put Captain Maurice saint Leger Farmer out of the road. But he was a square sort of chap in his way, this lovelorn Jenkins. He balked at the idea of murder, and a duel would have put him in peril of losing Marguerite by dying. So he let Farmer severely alone, and contented himself by waiting impatiently until the drunken husband emeritus should see fit to die. And until that happy hour should come, he declared that Marguerite was at least his wife in the eyes of heaven. Startingly novel mode of gluing together the fragments of a fractured commandment. But the strange part of the affair is that Captain Jenkins' eminently respectable family consented to take the same view of the case and publicly welcomed Marguerite as the captain's legal wife. And so, for a time, life went on. Marguerite was as nearly respectable as the laws of her time gave her the right to be. Jenkins was all devotion. She was moderately well received in local society, and she kept on winning the hearts of all the men who ventured within her sway. Then, into her life, swirled Charles John Gardiner, Earl of Blessington, one of the most eccentric and thoroughly delightful figures of his day. Blessington was an Irish peer, a widower, a man of fashion. He had a once enormous rent roll that had been sadly honeycombed by his mad extravagances, but that still totaled $150,000 a year. What chance had the worthy but humble Captain Jenkins against this golden-tinged whirlwind wooer? And the answer to that conundrum is the same that serves for the question concerning the hackneyed snowball in the inferno. Blessington swept Marguerite off her feet, bore her away from the protesting captain, and installed her in a mansion of her own. Then, too late, came the happy event for which Jenkins and Marguerite had so optimistically been looking. In October, 1817, Captain Maurice saint Leger Farmer joined some boon companions in an all-night orgy in the upper room of a pothouse. Farmer waxed so much drunker than usual that he mistook the long window of the room for the door. Bidding his friends good-bye, he strolled out of the window into space. Being a heavier-than-air body, in spite of the spirits that buoyed him up, he drifted downward into the courtyard below, breaking his miserable neck. Marguerite was free. Jenkins hastened to her and besought her to marry him, offering her an honorable name and a place in the world, and pointing out to her how much better off she would be in the long run as Mrs. Captain Jenkins than as the brevet bride of a dissolute earl. But Blessington had by this time become the helpless thrall of Marguerite's charm. As soon as he heard of Farmer's death, he whisked her off to church and married her. And by way of doing all things handsomely, he soothed the disconsolate Jenkins' feelings 
with a fifty thousand dollar check thereby securing firm title to the goodwill and fixtures of the previous tenant of his wife's heart the earl took his new wife to his ancestral home at mount joy forest and there the couple kept open house spending money like drunken sailors and having a wonderful time it was the first chance marguerite had ever had for spending any large amount of money she so well improved her opportunities along this line and got such splendid results therefrom that she was nicknamed by a flowery irish admirer the most gorgeous lady blessington and the name stuck to her to her delight all through life blessington had always been extravagant now goaded on by marguerite he proceeded to make the prodigal son look like gaspard the miser one of his lesser expenditures was the building of a theatre on his own estate that he and marguerite might satisfy to the full their love for amateur theatricals at this theatre they and their friends were the only performers and their friends were the only spectators the performances must have been gems of histrionic and literary excellence and a rare delight to every one concerned it would have been worth walking barefoot for miles to witness one of them for the actors were bound by a list of hard and fast rules devised and written out by lord blessington himself you may judge the rest of these rules by the first which read every gentleman shall be at liberty to avail himself of the words of the author in case his own invention fails him one's heart warms to the genius who could frame that glorious rule for stage dialogue but marguerite was of no mind to be mured up in an irish country house with perhaps an occasional trip to dublin she had begun to taste life and she found the draught too sweet to be swallowed in sips she made blessington take a house in st james square in london there for the next three years she was the reigning beauty of the capital her salons were the most brilliant spots in the london season her loveliness made her and her home a centre of admiration she had more than good looks more even than charm she had brains and she had true irish wit a wit that flashed and never stung she had too the knack of bringing out the best and brightest elements in every one around her so while men adored her women could not bring themselves to hate her she was in her element there in london but blessington was not in his he enjoyed it all but he was no longer young and he had led a lightning rapid life so though he was ever a willing performer the merciless pace began to tell on him marguerite was quick to notice this and she suggested that a nice long lazy tour of the continent might brace him up marguerite's lightest suggestions were her husband's laws so to the continent they went and london mourned them they set off in august eighteen twenty two no irish nobleman says one biographer and certainly no irish king ever set out on his travels with such a retinue of servants with so many vehicles and appliances of all kinds to ease to comfort and the luxurious enjoyment of travel they planned to go by easy stages stopping wherever they chose and for as long as the fancy held them they travelled in a way a modern pork king might envy one day in paris at the races lady blessington exclaimed there is the handsomest man i have ever seen one of the throng of adorers hanging about the blessington box confessed to knowing the stranger and he was accordingly sent off post haste to bring the handsomest man to the box the personage who was so lucky as to draw forth this cry of admiration from marguerite was at that time but eighteen years old yet already he was one of the most noted or notorious men about town in all europe he was alfred guillaume gabriel count d'orsay a typical ouida hero 
he was six feet in height with broad shoulders small hands and feet hazel eyes and chestnut hair he was an all-around athlete could ride fence box skate shoot and so on through the whole list of sports he was a brilliant conversationalist he could draw he could paint he was a sculptor and at none of these things was he an amateur but as good as most front-rank professionals he was later to win fame as the premier man of fashion of the period a once celebrated book the complete dandy had d'orsay for its hero everybody who came in touch with the youthful paragon fell victim to his magnetism and even lord blessington who should have been wise enough to see what was coming was no exception young d'orsay at marguerite's instigation was invited to go along with the blessingtons on the rest of their travels he accepted this meant his resignation from his regiment which was at that moment under orders to leave france to invade spain he threw over his military career without a qualm he had fallen in love at sight with the most gorgeous lady blessington who was fourteen years his senior and at sight she had fallen in love with him it was the love of her life the party moved on to genoa here they met lord byron who had found england a chilly abiding place after the disgraceful affair that had parted him from his wife byron was charmed by lady blessington's beauty and cleverness and spent a great deal of time with the blessington party of tourists d'orsay he liked immensely once referring to him as a greek god returned to earth marguerite he frankly adored and so far as one knows that was all the good it did him with a wonder youth of the d'orsay type ever at her side lady blessington was not likely to lose her sophisticated heart to a middle-aged lame man whose power over women was at this time largely confined to girls in their teens but byron was the greatest living poet as well as the greatest living charlatan and marguerite consented to be amused in desultory fashion by his stereotyped form of heart siege even though his powers of attack were no longer sufficient to storm the citadel still the time passed pleasantly enough at genoa and byron solved his bruised vanity by wheedling lord blessington into buying his yacht a boat that the poet had long and vainly tried to get rid of faring better with my lord than with my lady he sold the boat at a fancy figure there was a farewell banquet at which he drank much then the blessingtons and d'orsay departed from genoa on the white elephant yacht and byron stood on the quay and wept aloud as they sailed off they went to rome but the eternal city somehow did not appeal to lady blessington so they gave it what would now be vulgarly termed the once over and passed on to naples here marguerite was delighted with everything the trio took a naples house and lived there for two and a half years the mansion lord blessington rented was the palazzo belvidere which cost him an enormous sum but like an automobile the initial price was the smallest item of its expense marguerite perhaps to atone to herself for the squalor of her rickety girlhood home declared the place would not be fit to live in until it had been refitted according to her ideas her ideas cost a fortune to carry out but when at last the work was done she wrote that the palazzo was one of the most delicious retreats in the world she also hit on a thoroughly unique if costly scheme for sightseeing for example when she visited herculaneum it was with the archaeologist sir william gell as guide when she went to museums and art galleries she took along a showman such celebrities as unwin the painter westmacott the sculptor or the antiquary milligan and when she visited the observatory it was under the guidance of sir john herschel 
and the Italian astronomer Piazzi. More than one of these notables sighed hopelessly for her love. From Naples, the party went to Florence. Here, Walter Savage Landor met Marguerite, and he was little behind Byron in his appreciation of her charms. By this time, nay, long before this time, people had begun to talk, and to talk quite distinctly. Marguerite did not care to be the butt of international gossip, so she enlisted her husband's aid in an effort to silence the scandalous tongues. Blessington's mode of doing this was highly characteristic of the most eccentric man living. He promptly offered to make D'Orsay his heir if the latter would marry Lord Blessington's fifteen-year-old daughter, the Earl's only living child by his first wife. D'Orsay did not object. It mattered little to him whom he married. The girl was sent for to come to Florence, and there she and D'Orsay were made man and wife. The trio thus enlarged to a quartet. All hands next set off for Paris. Lady Blessington learned that the house of Marechal Ney was vacant, and she made her husband take it at a staggering rental. And again, she was not satisfied until the place had been done over from top to bottom. The job was finished in three days, the army of workmen receiving triple pay for quadruple speed. Lady Blessington's own room was designed by her husband. He would not allow her to see it until everything was in readiness for her. This is her own description of it. The bed, which is silvered instead of gilt, rests on the backs of two large silver swans, so exquisitely sculptured that every feather is in alto relievo, and looks nearly as fleecy as those of a living bird. The recess in which it is placed is lined with white fluted silk, bordered with blue embossed lace, and from the columns that support the frieze of the recess, pale blue silk curtains, lined with white, are hung, which, when drawn, conceal the recess altogether. A silvered sofa has been made to fit the side of the room opposite the fireplace. Pale blue carpets, silver lamps, ornaments silvered to correspond. The salle de bain is draped with white muslin trimmed with lace. The bath is of white marble, inserted in the floor, with which its surface is level. On the ceiling, a painting of flora scattering flowers with one hand, while from the other is suspended an alabaster lamp in the form of a lotus. It was in this house that Lord Blessington died of apoplexy in 1829, perhaps after a glimpse of the bills for renovating the place. Marguerite, on his death, was left with a jointure in his estate, which estate by this time had dwindled to $50,000 per annum. Her sole share of it was $7,500 a year and the Blessington townhouse in London. All along, D'Orsay and his wife had been living with the Blessingtons. When Lady Blessington came back to England, they accompanied her, and the three took up their odd form of life together at Gore House in Kensington. Albert Hall now stands on its site, for Marguerite could not afford to keep up the Blessington mansion. She tried to eke out her income by writing, for she still had the pen gift that had so awed her brothers and sisters. One of her first pieces of work was a book based on her talks with Byron back in the Genoa days. The new monthly magazine first printed serially this capitalization of a dead romance. The volume later came out as Conversations with Byron. And of all Marguerite's eighteen books, this is perhaps the only one now remembered. She was engaged at $2,500 a year to supply a newspaper with society items. Then, too, she edited Gems of Beauty, a publication containing portraits of fair women, with a descriptive verse written by her under each picture, straight hack work. Altogether, she made about $5,000 a year by her pen, a goodly income for a woman writer in her day, 
or in any day for that matter among her novels were meredith grace cassidy the governess and the victims of society you have never read any of them i think if you tried to as did i they would bore you as they bored me they have no literary quality and their only value is in their truthful depiction of the social life of her times she did magazine work too and wrote for such chaste publications as friendship's offering the amulet keepsakes and others of like mushiness of name and matter once more her salons were the talk of all england and once more the best men crowded to them but no longer did the best women frequent the blessington receptions the scandal that had been hushed by the sacrifice of the earl's daughter to a man who loved her stepmother had blazed up fresh when the d'orsays went to live at gore house with marguerite and women fought shy of the lovely widow it is one of the mysteries of the ages that so canny an old libertine as lord blessington should have been hoodwinked by d'orsay and marguerite there is no clue to it except perhaps he was not fooled perhaps he was too old too sick too indifferent to care and when d'orsay's unhappy young wife in eighteen thirty eight refused to be a party any longer to the disgusting farce and divorced her husband the gossip whispers swelled to a screech the wife departed d'orsay stayed on there is every reason to think marguerite was true to her young greek god but if so it was not for lack of temptation or opportunity to be otherwise in her late forties and early fifties she was still the most gorgeous lady blessington still as lovely as magnetic as adorable as in her teens among the men who delighted to honor her salons with their frequent presence and more than one of them made desperate love to their hostess were bulwer dickens thackeray sir robert peel captain marriott brougham landseer tom moore disraeli and many another genius disraeli one day to rule british politics as lord beaconsfield was at that time merely a brilliant politician and an almost equally brilliant novelist there is a story i don't vouch for it that piqued at marguerite's coldness toward himself disraeli revenged himself by portraying d'orsay right mercilessly as count mirabeau in his henrietta temple landor was drawn by her lure into returning to england the aged duke of wellington too was a guest at her more informal at homes marguerite used such influence as she possessed over the duke to persuade him to let d'orsay paint his portrait so well did the picture turn out that the duke cried in delight at last i've been painted as a gentleman to the blessington salons came an american a man whose clothes were the hopeless envy of broadway and whose forehead curl was imitated by every yankee dandy who could afford to buy enough pomatum to stick a similar curl to his own brow he was n p willis you don't even start at the name yet that name used to thrill your grandmother willis was a writer and gained more temporary fame for less good work than any other author our country has produced during a tour of england he was fortunate enough to receive an invitation to call on lady blessington and thereafter he called almost every day he fairly raved over her she is one of the most lovely and fascinating women i have ever known he wrote then he wrote more he wrote a story of something that happened at one of her soirees he sent it to an american paper never dreaming it would ever be seen in england but the story was reprinted in an english magazine and d'orsay showed willis the door another visitor to gore house was a pallid puffy princeling out of a job and out of a home he was louis napoleon 
reputed nephew of napoleon the great and he was one day to reign as napoleon the third emperor of the french in the meantime exiled from france he knocked around the world morbidly wondering where his next suit of ready-made clothes was to come from he even visited the united states for a while teaching school at bordentown new jersey and sponging for loans and dinners from the jumelles and other people kindly disposed to the bonaparte cause just now he was in england living when he could on borrowed money and sometimes earning a few shillings by serving as special policemen outside of big houses where dances or receptions were in progress out of the few english homes open to the prince was marguerite blessington's marguerite and d'orsay took him in fed him lent him money and did a thousand kindnesses to the poor outlawed fellow you shall learn in a few minutes how he repaid their generosity while marguerite had a talent for writing she had a positive genius for spending money and where talent and genius clash there can be only one final result her talent as i have said brought her about five thousand dollars a year her income from her husband's estate was a yearly seven thousand five hundred dollars more but how could people like marguerite and d'orsay keep abreast of the social current on a beggarly twelve thousand five hundred dollars a year the foregoing is a question not a flight of rhetoric it has an answer and the answer is they went into debt they threw away money as apt pupils of the lamented earl of blessington might readily have been expected to when they had no more money to pay with they got credit at first this was easy enough tradesmen high and low deemed it an honor to be creditors of the all-popular dowager countess of blessington and of the illustrious count d'orsay and even after the tradesmen's first zest died down the couple were clever enough to arrange matters in such a way as to keep right on securing goods for which they knew they never could hope to pay stripped of his glamour his pretty tricks and his social position d'orsay shows up as an unadulterated deadbeat a sublimated panhandler while marguerite's early experience in helping shiver the frills ward off bailiffs and such like gold seekers now stood in her fine stead they were a grand pair their teamwork was perfect between them they succeeded in rolling up debts amounting to more than five hundred and thirty five thousand dollars to tradesfolk alone d'orsay in addition to this managed to borrow about sixty five thousand from over trustful personal friends thackeray is said to have drawn from them the inspiration of his vanity fair essay on how to live on nothing a year d'orsay before consenting to let his wife divorce him had stipulated that the earl's daughter pay him a huge lump sum out of the blessington estate he was also lucky at so-called games of chance and his painting brought in a good revenue but all this money was swallowed up in the bottomless gulf of extravagance little by little the tradesmen began to realize that they were never going to be paid and they banded together to force matters to a crisis in that era debt was still punishable by imprisonment and prison gates were almost ready to unbar in hospitable welcome to marguerite and d'orsay like dick swiveller who shut for himself one by one every avenue of egress from his home by means of unpaid-for purchases in neighboring streets d'orsay discovered that it was no longer safe to leave the house officers with warrants lurked at the area railings of gore house tip staves loitered on the front steps all sorts of shabby people seemed eager to come into personal contact with alfred guillaume gabriel count d'orsay on sunday alone when the civil arm of the law rests did the much sought-after couple dare emerge from the once joyous house which had grown to be their beleaguered castle no longer 
could they entertain as of yore least a rascally warrant server slip into the drawing-room in the guise of a guest finally the net tightened to such an extent that d'orsay had great ado to slip through its one gap but slip through he did and escaped by night to france marguerite's wit arranged for his escape and the man who lately had disdained to take a weekend journey without a half dozen servants and a half score trunks was forced to run away in the clothes he wore and with single portmanteau marguerite joined him at boulogne little better equipped than he oh but there were heart-breaking sights in those days in boulogne in calais and in havre englishmen who had fled their own country for debt used to haunt the french seaboard as being nearer their own dear land than was paris they used to pace the esplanades or cower like sick dogs on the quays straining their eyes across the tumbled grey water to glimpse the far-off white cliffs of their homeland they would flock to the pier when the channel packets came in longing for the sight of a home face dreading to be seen by someone who had known them in sunnier days sneered at by the thrifty french denied a penny's worth of credit at the shops they dragged out desolate lives fifty times more bitter than death it was no part of marguerite's scheme to enroll d'orsay and herself among these hangdog exiles she had ever built air castles and she was still building them she had wonderful plans for a career in france she and d'orsay had done much for louis napoleon in his days of poverty and now louis napoleon was president of france and already there were rumors that he would soon make himself emperor he was the man of the hour and in his heyday of prosperity he assuredly could do no less than find a high government office for d'orsay and pour a flood of golden coin into the lap of the most gorgeous lady blessington let me save you from suspense by telling you that louis napoleon did nothing of the sort indeed he seemed much embarrassed and not at all overjoyed by the arrival of his old benefactors in paris he made them many glittering promises but the bank of fools itself would have had too much sense to discount such promises as louis napoleon was wont to make soon after their arrival in paris marguerite learned that creditors had swooped down upon gore house seizing it and all the countless art treasures that filled it house and contents went under the hammer and brought a bare sixty thousand dollars not enough to pay one of the d'orsay blessington debts marguerite was at the end of her career she was sixty years old her beauty was going her money was gone she had ruled hearts she had squandered fortunes she had gone through the dark spot ninety-nine per cent of whose victims sink thence to the street while the hundredth has the amazing luck to emerge as a superwoman she had listened to the love vows of men whose names are immortal and now she was old and fat and banished hope was dead a younger and stronger woman might readily have succumbed under such a crisis certainly marguerite blessington was in no condition to face it soon after she arrived in paris she sickened and died d'orsay had loved her with fairly good constancy and he designed in her honor a double grave mausoleum of quaint design and under that mausoleum at chambouret she was buried three years later d'orsay was laid there at her side superwoman and superman they had loved as had cleopatra and antony only in the latter's day it was rome's vengeance and not a creditor warrant that cut short such golden romances end of chapter ten recording by linda johnson